Hi everyone, in this video we're going to go through section 3.2, Properties of Determinants. Uh, we begin the section um, with a theorem involving row operations and how they affect the how they affect the value of a determinant for a matrix. So um, in this theorem we have A saying a multiple of one row, if a multiple of one row of a matrix is added to another row to produce some resulting matrix B, then notice the determinant doesn't change. That's the significant. So when we do a row replacement operation, that does not affect the value of the determinant. Uh, letter B, if two rows are interchanged to produce some new matrix B, then the determinant of B is the opposite sign of the determinant of A. So when I, uh, when I switch rows, that negates the value of the determinant. And then letter C, um, this one hopefully makes sense. If you multiply a matrix A by some scalar K to produce a new matrix B, then the determinant of that new matrix is K times the determinant of A. So when you scale a matrix, you scale the determinant by that same factor. So let's use that theorem in this first example here where we're given a matrix A and we're going to do a couple of row operations, okay? And then compute the determinant after doing those row operations. Uh, the first one, I'm gonna the first step, I'm gonna do a row replacement, okay? So let me rewrite my matrix here. One, negative two, one, minus four, eight, seven, two, negative nine, and zero. And let's double and add, double row one, add row two, one, negative four, two, zero. Uh, if I double row one and add row two, I get another zero. Double row one, you get four, minus nine is five. There's my first row replacement operation. And then I just noticed I lost a sign on row three. That one there should have a negative sign in front of it. I missed it there. Um, so I need to add rows one and three. Okay, and I get a zero here. I get a three here. And I get a two here. All right, and now the claim here is that I have not changed the value of the determinant. The determinant of this matrix is the same as the determinant of this matrix. And you can check if you want to. You just type into your calculator the original matrix and see what you get as a uh, determinant. Okay. Um, and I'm going to do one more step uh, because if I have. Uh, a triangular matrix, so if I have all zeros below the diagonal, which I almost do here, then um, I can just multiply along the diagonal. So we can use a couple of row operations and then these properties of determinants to our advantage. So if I switch rows one and three, or excuse me, rows two and three, I get one, negative four, two, zero, three, two, zero, zero, five, right? Uh, now I can just r take, um, multiply down the diagonal, all right? But the, the 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 issue here is that because I did this switcheroo here, well, because I switched rows two and three, when I compute the determinant of A, the determinant of A, it is one times three times five. Oh, I just noticed a second mistake. How about that? That five should be a negative five. If you're catching these ahead of me, good job. It is, so the, the determinant is one times three times negative five, but because of that row replace or the, the row interchange that we did, we also get another factor of negative one in there. Okay. So our final determinant is a positive 15. Okay. And you can check the determinant of that matrix. If you expand it along row one or column three, whatever you want to do, you will get the same value of positive 15 for the determinant of that matrix. All right, let's do another example that'll be a few more steps, and I'm going to use a slightly different um, notation when I write this down. All right, and what I want to say is that the determinant of A is equal to, and I'm just going to write the, the, the straight lines without the brackets for each of these steps because what those mean, remember, is that the, we're, it's the determinant of what is inside of those um, straight lines. All right, and so my steps here that I want to take, uh, first I'm going to notice that row 1 is scalable by a factor of 2, so I can factor that 2 out essentially and not change the value of my determinant as long as I keep track of what I'm doing. So we have 2 times 1, negative 4, 3, 4, uh, 3, negative 9, 5, 10, 
I did 9, 5, 10. All I'm changing is that first row for right now. 1, negative 2, 1, minus 4, 0, and 6. There we go. Okay, so this, the determinant of A is equal to 2 times the determinant of what is between those vertical lines. All right, so now I can use some row replacements and not change my determinant at all. I'm going to use the 1 in the top row to eliminate everything below it. 1 minus 4, 3, 4. I would do negative 3 times row 1 and add the second row. If you do that, you get 0, 3, negative 4, and negative 2. Uh, if you do 3 times the first row, add the third row, you get 0, minus 12, 10, 10. And if you negate row 1, add row 4, 0, 0, negative 3, and 2. Okay, so the determinant has not changed. What we're doing is we're getting it into an echelon form, triangular matrix, so that I can multiply along the diagonal to get my determinant. All right, so what is my next step? Now I'm going to use this 3 here. Let me highlight it in a different color. This 3 here as my next pivot to eliminate everything below it. All right, so 2 times 1 minus 4, 3, 4, 0, 3, negative 4, negative 2. And when you do that, let's see, what are we going to do? We're going to do 4 row 2, 4 times row 2 and add row 3. You get 0, 0 negative 6, 2, and we don't need to do anything to row 3. Cool. All right, that, or row 4 that was. We didn't need to do anything to. Last step. One more step, and then we can get our determinant because we'll be in echelon form. It'll be a triangular matrix. All we've changed so far with our matrix, uh, it, with our determinant, is this factor of 2 out in front right from that first step. All right, uh, let's see. I don't need to do anything to row 1. I don't need to do anything to row 2, 0, 3, negative 4, negative 2. I don't need to touch row 3, 0, 0, negative 6, 2. And now I'm going to use the negative 6 pivot to eliminate the negative 3 below it. I'm going to multiply it by negative 1 half and then add the bottom row. Negative 1 half row 3, add row 4, 0, 0, 0, and 1. Okay, you want to be careful how you think about or how you write down that operation. I'm going to write it for this one. Negative one-half row um, three, add row four. I stored it in row four. That's what produced that. If you change the order, uh, do write down that operation a little bit differently. If you do like two times row four, or negative two times row four and add row three, you run into some... Uh, the possibility of making a mistake, okay? So you want to be careful with how you do that row replacement operation. You scale the pivot that you're using to eliminate what's below it, all right? So we are done putting it into echelon form, so we can just take and multiply along the diagonal to produce the determinant of our matrix, which happens to be negative 36 when you multiply that out. That is the determinant of the original matrix A and every step along the way. And then one piece to add on at the bottom here, I took an ugly picture out of the textbook um, rather than type this out. Um, this is how your calculator and computer programs um, find determinants of matrices, of, of larger matrices, of smaller matrices. This is the way that the coding works. Um, it, it reduces the matrix into an echelon form and then multiplies along the diagonal, keeping track of what changes are made along the way, whether something needs to be scaled or if you could do a row interchange. Um, this is how we compute determinants by hand efficiently and how it's done in, in the coding process. And on this slide, we kind of generalize that um, process, that concept. If A, my matrix A, has an echelon form U using row replacements and R, that's a lowercase r for our row interchanges, then the determinant of A is negative 1 to the R, the negative 1 for each row interchange to the rth power times the number, for, for, you know, if there's that many row interchanges, times the determinant of U, okay? So if U is missing a pivot, 
then the determinant of a is zero. So if along the way, if I lose a pivot, then I know that my determinant of my matrix is going to be zero. So these are the two scenarios in doing this row reduction. You either get negative one to the r times the product of the pivots, or you get zero. Theorem four is something that we've already kind of seen. Uh, if my determinant is non-zero, then my matrix is invertible. That's an if and only if, so it goes in both directions. If my matrix is invertible, then the determinant is not zero. In example three, we'll use all of the properties that we're looking at to kind of find the determinant as quickly as possible, and we'll do the same thing in the next example. All right, so uh, we'll take this matrix and we'll say, all right, I wanna find the determinant of my matrix A, and let's do, because it looks kind of ugly, let's do a row operation. So let's say I use the three to eliminate the negative six. I might use the three to eliminate the negative five, but that'll get a little bit ugly. Let's just start here. Three, negative one, two, negative five, zero, five, negative three, negative six. All right, I'm gonna use the three to eliminate the negative six. I get zero because I'm doubling row one and adding row three. I get uh, five, I get double row one, you get four, minus seven is negative three, negative 10 add four is negative six. So oh, that looks weird. Let me just rewrite row four, negative five, negative eight, zero and nine, okay? So what do you notice, right? Take a look at rows two and three, they are identical. So in one more row operation, I could eliminate one of them by negating and adding, which would give me a row of zeros, which would mean I am missing a pivot, which would mean the determinant is zero. Oh, so because we have those two identical rows, we know that right away that the determinant is zero. I don't need to do any more work. Well, I don't need to do any more work until I get to the next example, I guess. Uh, all right, so here's another one. And again, we'll use a combination of these processes. Um, to find the determinant of A as quickly as possible. And let's start out with a row operation. There's a two there, there's a negative two there, so I could pretty efficiently uh, use a row operation to, to start, the, start along the way. All right, so let's go zero, one, two, negative one. I'm gonna leave this two where it is, five, negative seven, and three. Uh, zero, three, six, two, and then I'm gonna add row two and four and I get zero. Uh, let's see, I get zero, I get negative three and one. All right, so there's my first step. Ooh, let's take a look at that. Now I have column one has a two with three zeros. So the determinant, if I now expand down column one is two, this is equal to two, but because the, the, the cofactor there would be negative, so it's negative two because it's the second entry in that column, and it's the second entry in column one. So we would have negative two times the determinant of the submatrix formed by removing that and removing that. Whoops, I circled the wrong one. By removing the, that row and column. So one, two, negative one, three, six, two, zero, minus three, and one. All right, now we can, let's say, do another row operation. Negative two times, one, two, one. Use the one to eliminate the three. Negative three times row one, uh, and that's gonna give me a zero there. Uh, negative three times negative one would be positive three, add two is five, zero, minus three, and one. Oh, okay, I'm almost triangular. All I need to do is switch rows two and three. And if I'm going to switch them, then I get another factor of negative one times negative two times one, two, one, zero minus three, one, zero, zero, five. All right, we're almost there. Let's move this over a little bit. Okay, so the determinant of A is equal to that negative one times the negative two times one, negative three, and positive five, because once we're triangular, we can just multiply down the diagonal. Looks like I have three negative signs, and then two times three is six, times five is 30. So the determinant of our matrix A is negative 30. Okay, but so we can use, depending on the matrix you're presented with, you can use 
any combination of those properties that like kind of first pops out as useful to you. Now this next theorem says that the determinant of a transpose is equal to the determinant of a. And the significance of that I've got at the bottom here with a lot of space between. I would normally go through this proof in class. I'm going to choose to not do it in the video and um, leave it to you to read in the book. It's a good proof. They use something called induction. So read proof in book. Okay, they use something called induction. They, if I can so show it for a small one by one matrix, and then uh, induction is you prove the the next step, right? If if I can show for a one by one, then it's true for a two by two, a three by three, a four by four. A proof by induction is pretty cool. Um, but the significance of this theorem is one I want to spend a little bit more time talking about. If the determinant of a transpose is the same as the determinant of a. That means that in theorem three, everywhere that you read the word row, you can replace that with the word column. Theorem three, look back in your notes, that was right from the beginning of the section that said you know, that you can do row operations, a, a row replacement operation and not change the determinant. Uh, you can exchange two rows and then you negate the determinant. You can factor something out of a row when you, that scales the determinant. Um, so you can replace all the word rows there with the word column. So you can do column operations in a matrix and not change the value of the determinant. Okay, you can do, if you switch to columns in a matrix, you negate the, de the, the value of the, of the determinant of the matrix that's formed. So that's how that theorem, or how this theorem is useful. It allows us even more options when we're trying to figure out determinants of matrix, matrices. And we will close out the section with theorem six and an example. The theorem says that uh, if I have two matrices, the determinant of their product is the product of the determinants. Okay, so, uh, and, and then what's at the bottom here, this is not true for sums. It may sound like it makes sense, but it is not true for sums of matrices. So it would be incorrect to write that the determinant of A plus B is the determinant of A plus the determinant of B. That is factually incorrect, not true for sums, but it is for products. And we could we could check that with a, a quick example here. All right, and in my example, um, where am I? This is example five in the section. My matrix A is six, three, one, two. My matrix B is four, three, one, two, four, three, one, two. And if you check, you can go ahead and find their product A times B is, uh, what did I get? 25, 20, 14, 13. There it is. 25, 20, 14, and 13. All right. So now let's get three different determinants. The determinant of A is 12 minus 3 is 9. The determinant of B is 8 minus 3 is 5. 9 times 5, by the way, 45. The determinant of A times B, right, that would be a little bit more complicated for me to do in my head, but 25 times 13 is 325, 325, and 20 times 14 is 280. Lo and behold, when you subtract them, you get 45. 9 times 5 is 45. Okay, so that's one example verifying that this property is in fact true. That's not a proof, it's, but it's an example. All right, that concludes section 3.2. Um, hopefully now you got enough skills to get working on the homework. Let me know if you have questions, if you run into problems, um, and I will do my best to answer them. Thank you very much for listening. Have a wonderful day.